a bit of progress with our system. As I said earlier, our vision for our system is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. For people, when? Today, um, tonight? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we live here for like upper like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Again, that was a real call. We have many of these examples where the calls quite don't go as expected, but the assistant understands the context, the nuance. It knew to ask for wait times in this case and handle the interaction gracefully. wireless or data transmission in part. That's very basic, so battery, and it's completely pain free to install. Yeah, very simple. So the process involves quite a large needle, uh, local anaesthetic, so it is pain free. Uh, it's popped in and then the uh, microchip is actually pre-loaded into the needle. It's just inserted in, taken out, plaster put on, heals in a few days, job done.
Uh, so currently we use the tech um, for the implants for opening doors, so all the office doors here. Now you can retrofit the house door, so I don't have keys to my house anymore, just have swipe entry. Uh, you can start a car, so fit one of my cars, put your hand on the steering wheel, the ignition starts, which is quite cool. It can store some basic data as well, so looking at basic medical data, potentially passports in the future. It could be used for contactless payments, London Underground, all sorts of payment systems. You could swipe your hand and figure out how to carry a wallet. Where it could take 15 20 minutes to get in the door, now it takes 25 seconds. Um, as a budget of OT, you're always trying to shave time because normal tasks take a hell of a long time with a spare hook. So to try and get some of that time back, it's fantastic. chemtrails go from horizon to horizon and they spread and they crisscross and they go next to one another and pretty soon the whole sky is cloudy and we don't know who's doing it we don't know what it is they're putting into the sky we think it's aluminum borium and strontium but we don't know for sure no one talks they can't do that in the sky above us without the provincial and the federal government being aware
background on who I am. I'm Dr. Nick Begich. I'm a uh, author and lecturer. I have a doctorate in traditional and complementary medicines. I was born and raised and spent most of my life here in Alaska. I also work as the executive director for the Lay Institute on Technologies based in Dallas, Texas. Um, its main mission is to educate the public on the impacts um, and repercussions of technology so that we can be prepared uh, in this century. The first topic today that we want to cover is updates on the HARP story, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, which many people are familiar with. This, this project initially was a joint effort of the Air Force and Navy to build large radio transmitters here in Alaska. These transmitters would occupy a uh, huge area. Initially, it was 48 antenna in the array. These are antennas that are 72 feet tall, have a cross dipole, so across the top you'll see this uh, type of a shape. These are about 70 feet across. Uh, there's 48 in the array. Um, eventually, at the end of this coming summer, summer of 2005, we'll be seeing 180 antenna in the array, and eventually the full array will be 360 antenna. The idea between these um, radio frequency generators is to focus radio frequency energy in a much different way uh, than, than most of us think about radio frequency energy uh, coming off of an antenna, if we think of it at all. But when you think about it, when you go back to the original companies that started this project, it was a company called Arco Power Technologies, Inc., which was a subsidiary of Atlantic Richfield, one of the largest oil and gas companies at that time operating in Alaska. They sold that subsidiary to E-Systems, which is a military um, contractor, a large military contractor based in Washington, D.C., who later sold it to Raytheon, who later sold it um, to uh, British Aerospace, which now controls uh, that technology. But in the course of that, one of the things that they had talked about was what's called earth-penetrating tomography. This is the idea of sending a signal up into the ionosphere, I oscillating that signal off the ionosphere, which actually causes that layer 30 miles above the Earth's surface to begin to vibrate in harmony with the signal on the ground, causing it to act as a giant broadcast antenna, sending that signal back down to the Earth, uh, and it passes through the Earth and see in the form of an ELF, an extremely low frequency signal, a very long wavelength that efficiently passes through the Earth, um, and that can be used for a number of things, including Earth penetrating tomography, the idea of looking into the Earth, or in plain language, it would be like, um, by comparison, X-raying the Earth, or looking into the Earth for underground mineral layers, underground shelters, nuclear facilities, uh, and the like. Brooks' concern was much broader um, in terms of what could be triggered with Earth penetrating tomography. And one of the things that he noted was the effect of resonance, this idea of sending energy in, it harmonizes in a way that causes the energy actually to be more than the sum of the total. You know, it's like the um, old World War I stories where the armies were marching across wooden bridges in Europe and some hours after they had marched across, the bridges would just collapse. And it was the rhythmic um, beat of the march across that bridge that set up um, essentially a vibration that eventually collapsed the entire uh, structure. This idea of resonance when applied to earth penetrating tomography at very high power levels causes concern for many scientists, including Brooks Agnew, because what he believes is possible is to trigger um, events uh, within the earth, geophysical events, earthquake, volcanic eruptions, the kinds of things that may already be on the edge of discharge and with the right resonant energies added into the system cause them to overload and actually fracture. In fact, it was William Cohen that actually uh, made the statement um, regarding uh, uh, wep weapons of mass destruction and the idea of generating earthquakes artificially. Weapons of mass destruction and the idea of generating earthquakes artificially. Weapons of mass destruction and the idea of generating earthquakes artificially. The blueprint for HARP, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. What does HARP do? HARP is, uh, is a large antenna where we beam radio frequency energy up into the upper atmosphere and we create on a small scale what the sun normally does. The assignment came that the Navy and the Air Force were to manage the program. There were some other ideas both to possibly modify weather. In 1983 I did radio tomography with 30 watts looking for oil in the ground. I found 26 oil wells over a nine-state area, 
and 100% of the time was accurate with just 30 watts of power beaming straight into solid rock. HARP uses a billion watts beam straight into the ionosphere for experiments. Picture these strings on the piano as layers of the earth. Each one has its own frequency. What we used to do is beam radio waves into the ground and it would vibrate any strings that were present in the ground. We might get a sound back like and we'd say that's natural gas. We might get a sound back like and we say that's crude oil. We were able to identify each frequency. We accomplished this with just 30 watts of radio power. If you do this with 2 billion watts, the vibrations are so violent that the entire piano would shake. In fact, the whole house would shake. In fact, the vibrations could be so severe underground that could even cause an earthquake. 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 earthquake.